Welcome to the Middle East and North Africa Union as we connect with you through the global virtual camp meeting. I want to pause for a moment and pray before we begin this seminar. Oh Lord our God, throughout the world there are people who need to know you, and many of those are right here in the Middle East and North Africa. Lord, as we connect virtually, we know that your presence is real and that you are stirring in the hearts of people all through this great land. So please come, Lord, and teach us what we need to know today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When the Middle East North Africa Union was formed in 2012, we adopted the theme of STEP into the impossible because so many people consider the giant task of mission to be impossible in the Middle East North Africa Union. Now, I have a question for you. When you think of the Middle East or North Africa, what do you think of? Most people think of vast deserts or uh, men who are wearing the traditional turban or completely covered women. Maybe it's faithful people who are praying for God to give them a revelation or those who go on pilgrimage to Mecca. But I have a, a little bit different of a picture I want to give to you for a few moments because the Middle East and North Africa are lands that have rich history. Some of the history stretches back into Bible times and there is rich artwork and beautiful places all through the Middle East and North Africa Union. Some of the people here really don't know Jesus. And the question we have to ask is who will share with them the good news about Jesus and his second coming? Who's going to share with the young men, with the old men, with the women of the region, and even with the children as they learn to be faithful to the religion of their families? Who's going to share in the places all around the Middle East and North Africa where people are hungry for God to do something in their lives? When uh, we look at the raw scripture passages, Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't give any exclusions for nations. When we look at Revelation 14, 6, it says, Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It doesn't exclude any person, no matter their, their poverty or their wealth, no matter their youth or their age, no matter the nation or the ethnicity of their background, that these two passages give us the framework, the bookends, for the mission that we do in the Middle East and North Africa Union. You see, the Middle East and North Africa is made up of 20 nations, ranging all the way on the far west in Morocco and Western Sahara, to the far east in Iran, in the south in Yemen and Sudan, in the north in Turkey, and all the nations in between with our five fields and regions where we have a work going on in some form in every single country of MENA. When uh, we really started praying through this theme of the step into the impossible, we basically decided that there would be no holds barred on how to share the gospel, that we would use every possible way to share the gospel with a difficult part of the world that we would look at centers of influence and church planters and health materials and seminars and literature and media and a, a program we call the Waldensian Students and Tent Makers and any other means within God-glorifying, legal, and transparent means to share the gospel with this region. 
When we began in 2012, there were 51 cities of at least a million in the Middle East and North Africa Union. These 25, at least 25 of those cities we considered to be completely unentered. Cities like Dubai were part of that 51. Cities like Cairo, which already had churches in it, along with Dubai. Cities like Istanbul, where there are millions and millions of people waiting to hear the gospel. Cities like Abu Dhabi and Tehran, Iran. Cities like Mecca. You see, all across this territory, by 2021, there are now 52 cities of at least a million or more. And 11 of them, as of today, are unentered with the gospel. Now, at least four of those had been entered with the gospel before. But because of war and strife, things have continued to shift, and we have to consider them unentered again. Are we satisfied that we're making tremendous progress from 2012 to 2021, that we've added 14 cities of at least a million where we have been able to enter in? No, we are not satisfied at all because our humble efforts, while they are reaching and exposing some to the gospel, are not adequate to reach the 20 nations of this great region. In the region of the Middle East and North Africa, there are at least 558 million people who are spread across these nations. That's half over half a billion population. When the union was reformed in 2012 and really given a massive commission by the church and already by God to do its best to reach the people of these nations, there was a membership of only just over 3,100 people. And at that time, there was a Adventist to non-Adventist ratio of one Seventh-day Adventist for every 174,000 people of the general population in this union. That compares to places like South America Division, where there is one Seventh-day Adventist for every 81 people, or North America Division, where there is one Seventh-day Adventist for every 260 people. At that time, when the, in 2012, when this union was really started with all of its territories, if every single member had shared the gospel faithfully with one other person every single day, it would have taken us 478 years to complete the task. I don't know about you, friends, but I would like to go home. I want Jesus to come so badly. I want to go home. So we in the Middle East and North Africa Union over the last eight years of our existence have done our very best, even through our small efforts, to glorify God, to give the message that he's given us to this world. And I can say that as of today, after eight years of faithful but small ministry, that we have a 70 plus percent increase in membership, that today there are 5,375 members, again, spread out across the 20 countries. That's not much but that the ratio of Adventist to non-Adventist has come down from 1 to 174,000 to one seventh the Adventist to 103,000 people today. And that means that today, if every single Seventh-day Adventist shared the gospel faithfully with at least one other person, with just a simple sharing of the gospel with one other person every single day, 
that it would be 284 years before the Gospel Commission were faithfully concluded in this region. I don't know how you feel about that, but 284 years is a long time to wait for Jesus to come. I'm very happy that in nine years only, we have been able to reduce by 194 years our time of completion to the Gospel Commission. But I also want to say, is it enough? No, it is not enough for us. We want to do better. We want to reach more people. We want to have more outposts in the cities and outside the cities. We want to reach every city of a million or more, every tribe, language, and people of this great region. And there are so many tribes, so many languages, where even today we still do not have a worker placed or even a church member. And I want to appeal to you that even while I am sharing with you today, that you'd be willing to pray for the Middle East and North Africa Union. God is somehow blessing our efforts in spite of the challenge. And today, I want to share some amazing stories with you of how God is utilizing the small but faithful efforts of workers spread across the 20 nations of the Middle East and North Africa. We see today the small raindrops of God's power being poured out in our region. I'll begin with a story uh, on the African continent in the Arabic-speaking country of Sudan. In this particular country, we have so many tribes where they have not heard the gospel and where people are still hungering and thirsting to have even a, a, a small um, witness. But it was a few years ago when Abdul Karim, not his real name for security purposes, ran across some Christian missionaries and as he did, uh, he heard the gospel with all his heart. He listened and the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart powerfully and he gave his life to Jesus and he was baptized. And through his ministry, actually many groups, 10 small groups were formed that worshiped Jesus. And little by little over the years, they were exposed to Seventh-day Adventists who taught them about the Bible Sabbath and about creation and about God's love for them and about his second coming. Just last year, in the month of December, Abdul Karim was baptized a Seventh-day Adventist and now is reaching out to our leaders in this part of our territory. And he's saying, can't you send someone to help me to share the gospel? I need somebody to come and really disciple me fully and another person who got baptized with him. And we want to share the gospel with all those who we have been working with for these years of faithful ministry. Would you pray for Abdul Karim? and the people who he is working with, that they would see the full light of the truth as it is in the word of God, the truth about who God is and about Jesus coming again. One thing I like to say is all throughout the 20 countries of the Middle East and North Africa, all throughout these nations, we see the blessings of God. And I could tell you story after story after story, moving through each nation, saying we see God working in ways that we couldn't expect when we came here. And we're reminded of a passage that Jesus says in Matthew 5.16, right there in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We believe that we should be shining our light. And there is another passage in Daniel that plays on this light theme. And I love that we find it in the prophetic book of Daniel, which is so precious to us. Daniel 12 verse 3 says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Really, our goal throughout the Middle East and North Africa is to do our best to shine for Christ and to lead many to righteousness. Let me just share again some stories with you. Several years ago, a study was done on the large unentered cities, unreached cities of the world. Found that one of those cities was right here in the Middle East and North Africa. And as we saw that this city had four and a half million people, and without one Seventh day Adventist, a young family was to come from the US, and this young family started there. They joined a, a diplomat, the family that was already in the area, and then some students from the university, and they formed a small group while the family that came from the U.S. were working on starting a small center of influence. Little by little, they began to connect with others. Students came to help them, and little by little, the Lord blessed their efforts and a few years ago, we were able to organize a church right there in this massive city with students, with a few foreign workers, with a few locals. And in that city is not only a church, but some small groups that are forming that really are studying the gospel with them. And I look at this and I say, wow, God is so faithful to his people even though our efforts may not be extremely fruitful in every way. But we see that God is working through people like this young lady and her family. We also see work steadfastly going on among refugees. Here in Lebanon, we have a Iraqi couple who, um, after they left Iraq, they settled right here in Beirut. And every month, they have special ministry for the Iraqi refugees. Basim and Basma Farjo are long-standing uh, members and leaders in the church in Iraq. But they have devoted their energies, their time, to reaching out and showing love to many refugees who come here to Lebanon because they couldn't stay in their home country anymore. They help them with practical needs like food and clothing, sometimes assisting them to help people find places to live, and really giving their heart and ministry to the people who have come far away from their own home and have to live outside of it. We also have here in Beirut a, a beautiful center. It's called the Adventist Learning Center. And again, a, a foreigner came some time back and started the center her name is Alexis, and Alexis came as a social worker, and she started by assessing the work and the needs of Beirut. Really, a lot of the Lebanese told her, she, they said the biggest problem is a lot of the Syrian refugee children don't have a place to get educated. They need a place to go to school. So Alexis partnered with a, a Lebanese-Armenian lady, and they started a center of influence that is really a learning center, but it's a school. In this learning center, if you walk inside any day, when they're having in-person meetings, um, much of the time they've had to meet through online because of the pandemic, but when they're in person, you walk inside and there's these joyful children. They're meeting you. They're Even though they're refugees and maybe from families who are struggling to make a living, they're in the center. They get a meal. They get an education. They're learning all the basics of education. And they learn in Arabic and in English. And there's just this really happy atmosphere. And every day after classes, the 
um, faculty at this small learning center, the staff, they go out and they visit the homes of the parents to visit them, to give them some time of connection, but they also look for any practical needs that they could help with as they go and minister to the, to the people. They're going in the name of Jesus, knowing that they're Christians, and little by little they do so much. Connected with the center are many families who have come together each week to worship God on Sabbath. And they come together and they, they study in groups, men and women differently, children and youth separately, and they study the Word of God. And it's been so encouraging to me when I go into the center on Sabbath to see the youth, the men and the women, hungry for the Word of God, studying. I remember one day I was in there and I was asked to lead the men's group that day. It was a small group Bible study on Matthew chapter 13. And here I was, you know, leading along and one of the participants kept interrupting me. He kept saying, Pastor Rick, let me say something. And Pastor Rick, I want to comment. And Pastor Rick, what about this thought? I thought, wow, this guy is really, really um, assertive with his knowledge. Come to find out that he had a very special story of how God had worked in his life through miracles, through healing, through a, a dream that he had, through God's providing for his life over and over again, and through all of these interventions that God had done in his life, that he had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He had had to overcome many obstacles uh, with his work life, with smoking, with his family. All kinds of things came up. But day by day over years, he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And one day he invited me to come to the center where he had invited all of his friends and family. And as I came to the center that day, there were over 120 people and he brought them together for one purpose, that on this Sabbath, he would share his personal testimony of God's deliverance for him. And when he shared the testimony, it was incredible because in the testimony, he specifically said, if you want to belong to a church that loves you, a church that is filled with love and truth, then you need to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And then he shared why. That when he had been very, very sick, some Seventh-day Adventists took him into their home right here on our campus at Middle East University. And they helped him to get a healthy diet. Then another Seventh-day Adventist helped him at a point of low economic times when he was struggling financially. And another one gave him some nutritional food to eat. And another one helped him with some challenge he was having with his, his personal um, health and digestion. And yet another one gave him the Word of God to study. And little by little, as he shared, he said, Pastor Rick, and to the entire audience that was there, the Seventh-day Adventist who I've met loved me into the church. They loved me for who I was, even though I didn't know him. And they showed me a way to be a better person they showed me that it's practical to become Christian and to love Jesus. Well, it took some time, some years, for him to give his life fully to the Lord, but about two years ago, he was baptized. And after a while, we hired him as a global mission pioneer. And today, he is serving faithfully here in the city of Lebanon to plant a church among one of the largest unreached people groups in the world, his own people, who had spanned many countries in the Middle East and North Africa, which have a rich heritage, but also a heritage where they have been um, kind of not favorably looked on by some of the countries in the region. And so he's ministering to them, and he has been studying the Bible with at least a hundred of them every single week, whether in person or through Zoom. 
I don't know about you, but I'm inspired when I hear stories like this because God is working through people who have given their lives to him. I'll share a little story that uh, we were involved with on August 4, 2020. I was sitting in my office late in the day. I was going over a, a, some, some work and emails and spreadsheets that I was working on when suddenly the earth shook below my feet. And when the earth shook below my feet, it was a little terrifying. I thought it was an earthquake. But then almost immediately, a loud sound, louder than anything I'd ever heard in the course of my lifetime, happened. And all of our staff started rushing out of the building. Many of us thought maybe the, that uh, missile strike had happened right here in Beirut. But as we looked around, we couldn't really see anything. And then in the distance, while we were wondering what had happened, we could see the smoke rising from the port of Beirut, where the third largest urban explosion in history had just occurred. This massive explosion that rocked Beirut sent a powerful shockwave, both earthquake, sound, and a, a, a pressure blast that hit our office. When it hit my office, all the ceiling tiles of my office jumped and settled back down, but it destroyed the windows, the doors across campus, across all of the city of Beirut. A, a, trench of broken debris spread across the city for at least five miles. I was able to visit the blast site soon after, and I was so sobered by what I saw. City block after city block of damaged homes. 300,000 people lost their homes that day. 70,000 people lost their jobs. But do you know one thing that I saw that I really loved? I saw young people going out to the streets. Young people from across Lebanon going to the streets to help clean and repair the city of Beirut following this massive explosion. We came back to the university and we said, we must do something. And our Middle East University faculty, students, staff, our union staff, the church members in the region, we all started going down and cleaning the streets of Beirut together, offering help to people, going into their apartments and cleaning out their broken windows, their broken furniture, their broken doors, cleaning them out and trying to do what we could to help. It was one little way of spreading light in darkness. During the, those moments, we built friendships and relationships that continue to today. That team that went down, it was just moments in trying to help recover a city. But the world church responded. We started hearing from various divisions and universities and individuals which sent funds for us to help in our relief efforts. And we were able to help not only repair the campus and our churches and our schools, we helped young people with their getting into school. We helped many people repair their homes, whether they were church members or workers for the church or the community. We did our best to share. We also made food parcels and many of our team members were preparing hot meals and this time, though great in tragedy, was also a time when the church of God shined brightly during a time of need and where we could do our best in seeing how God was working in the area. Another story that I'll share with you, one of my last, is a story about a young man who was exposed to the gospel through his wife, who had moved from another country, and as she began attending church in one of our small groups in a large, unentered city, 
that little by little over years of prayer by his faithful spouse and interacting with some workers that we had sent to join in that city and to build up the work, that little by little, as he was exposed, he said, why don't you have the house church in my house? Praise God, over the course of four years, he grew to an understanding of who God was. And one day he came to the pastor in that city and he said, pastor, one who is planting the church there, just a small group. He said, pastor, I want to get baptized, but I want it to be a surprise to my wife. So they set up a special day where they would go to the beach to celebrate the birthday of some friends. So there on Sabbath afternoon, they went down, they sang happy birthday. And then as a pastor stood next to her husband, he said, but this is a special birthday. This is the birthday of your husband. Because today he has given his life to Jesus. And this is his spiritual birthday and the most perfect baptismal birthday picture I have ever seen was snapped that day. There you see the waters of baptism circulating over them in the shape of a heart, demonstrating God's love for him. And there in that city, another Waldensian student, somebody serving, doing outreach on a public campus, connected with another young man, And this young man was energetic and very social and gave his heart to the Lord as well. And the one being baptized in this picture started discipling this new young man right there in their hometown. And little by little, this young man has become Seventh-day Adventist through the waters of baptism as well. But it doesn't stop there. And this is how it should be for all of us. It, this young man is now sharing his faith with others who are sharing their faith with others. And now we have five generations from wife to husband to new young man to two more generations of people being discipled for the Gospel Commission right here in one of our large, unentered cities just five years ago. Today, there's a group there that worships every week. They worship there peacefully, but quietly, because they know that God is doing something special there, and that little by little, the mustard seed is growing out into a tree where the birds can come and rest in its branches. Stories like this are happening all across the Middle East and North Africa, where small groups are forming outside, where small groups are forming in unentered countries inside, where we have digital work going on with Zoom calls and Zoom Bible studies and Zoom small groups, where all around the region where we, when the pandemic began, that we switched entirely to digital world and where people would come into the digital Zoom calls and they would blacken their screen, they would put a fictitious name, but they would linger long where they had never physically been able to go inside a house or a church before because of fear of social repercussions in their society. But we see God working in miraculous ways all around this region through media, through church planters, through centers of influence, through the beautiful work of people who have come to the region and are planting groups, discipling others throughout the region. Over the last month was the month of Ramadan. And during this time, we have been promoting a special time of prayer where people would pray for the people of our region who were themselves fasting and praying. And through this 
time of season of prayer, of Ramadan, that God would reveal himself to people in this region and that one by one that they would have some sense of God giving them direction and they would come to our church members or our workers and they would ask the question, can you share the truth with me? And I believe that God is answering the prayer that we've been praying. During that Ramadan season, there is a special night called the Night of Power, and we redouble our efforts in prayer. We ask everybody in our region to please pray for our brothers and sisters from another faith throughout the region. Because during that time, it is said that God comes very close to the earth. And that as he's close, he's more accessible and that he will give special dreams and visions and revelations to his people. So we pray that Jesus would be seen by people throughout the region. And we know through our social media ministry, through partner ministries with Adventist Frontier Missions and many others, that these visions are happening and they are driving people to ask questions about who Jesus is and about when he is coming again. I don't know about you, friends, but I praise God for what he's doing. Even in our humble efforts to spread the word of God, our, in our weakness, he is strong. He is somehow utilizing the people who have responded to the call to come to Mena, whether they are workers for the church or whether they are tent makers who are using their own profession, their own way to reach the nations, and they come and they move in as an engineer or a businessman, whether they are a school teacher or an English professor, they come as tent makers without relying on the church financially. Maybe we, we also uh, see the same stories happening in the beautiful stories of other ministries that are sending people to us. We all cooperate together under the banner of the church headed by Jesus Christ. Through the church members, through the workers for the church, through supporting ministries that are sharing with us, through the tent makers who come on their own and also through wall dancing students who come spread across the region in public campuses where they're reaching other young people for the Lord. I don't know how this message touches you, but it touches me because I see people of every nation, tribe, language, and people people who are wealthy, people who are poor, people who are refugees who have left their country, and people who are long-time citizens in very deep-seated traditions who are giving their hearts to Jesus. I don't know about you. Are you willing and ready to step into the impossible with us? I don't know what your response is, but maybe some of you are asking, how can I help? Well, first of all, I want to ask you to pray. Pray for the people of our region. Pray for God to give dreams and visions. Pray for the workers of our region that God would protect them, yes, but also that they would have eyes of discernment to see who is out there who is seeking the Lord and to be able to connect with them and share a faithful witness with them. Pray every single day for the people of this region. Pray that they would have something in their life that would drive them to Jesus, drive them to their need. Secondly, prepare. When I say prepare, what does that mean? I mean prepare. Learn the language. Learn Arabic, Turkish, Farsi, French. Study English if you haven't known English before. Study Kabil and Kurdish. Study that Asia, study the languages of our people. Because one day, should the Lord move on your heart to move to this region, you will need to know the language. Also, in preparation, start, if you aren't already, 
to love others as Christ loved you. Don't wait till you have a missionary circumstance to enter your life. Every circumstance you have is a missionary circumstance right now. Go and love your neighbor today. Doesn't matter what color or language they speak, show love to them. Prepare for God's using you elsewhere by loving people now. Act globally by serving locally. You prepare your life better by serving the church, being faithful, loving others, doing Bible studies, helping them know the truth as it is in Jesus. Another way of preparation is through learning. Learn about culture. Learn about cross-cultural service. Learn as much as you can. Uh, Take the Institute of World Mission courses on culture online. Uh, Read the books that are out there like Passport to Mission. Go to the General Conference website called AdventistMission.org and go to the study centers and learn as much as you can about the different religions of the world. There are courses you can take online for that. Learn about culture. Learn about religion. Learn how to be a better witness. Some of you will ask, can we support you in different ways? Yes, there are always ways you can support us. There's ways that you can do things for us here that we may not be able to do for ourselves, like helping develop websites and helping with different functions that we do, maybe even by supporting the cause. If you want to know more about how to help us, write to me at info at adventistmena.org. But before I sign off, let me just share one more thing. There's one other way to help, and that is to go. That God is calling each of us to go and make disciples of all nations. Go. Go to your neighbor. Go to your community. And yes, if God is compelling you to go here, come to Mena. We may not have endless budgets to share and to hire people, but we welcome with open arms anyone who is able to come, who will partner with us in sharing the gospel, especially in these large unentered nations and cities where we are yet to establish a lighthouse for his kingdom. Just remember Jesus said, In Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. This is part of the mission that God has given us, is to glorify God in every part of the world. May God be with you while you pray for the world of Mena and consider how you can connect with us. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. God be with you.